First of all, I want to thank everyone at New America for helping make this event happen. Um, and I also want to recognize the members of the Yasunidos who are here in the room with us, who have come all the way from Ecuador to present a petition to the Inter-American Commission on Human Rights. Um, a year and a half ago, I heard a Planet Money piece on NPR about the world's most biodiverse rainforest, Yasuni National Park in the far western Amazon. The forest was filled with thousands of different species, including jaguars, giant armadillos, huge anacondas, giant otters, and other animals that most of us have never heard of. The place was so wild and so remote that there were tribes of uncontacted peoples living in absolute isolation from modern civilization. It kind of blew my mind. But Yasuni also sits atop 20% 20 20 of Ecuador's oil reserves, approximately 850 million barrels. I'm Levi Tilleman, the Jeff and Cal Leonard Fellow here at New America. And I want to thank you all for joining us for this important discussion on people power, political corruption, and the future of Yasuni National Park. Let's see. Before the remarks, I'm going to give a few comments about the political situation surrounding the future of developments in Yasuni. The current drama in Yasuni really extends back to, to 2006, when a charismatic young left-wing economist named Rafael Correa was elected president of Ecuador. He came to power on a wave of youth support in no small part thanks to his strong environmental stances. Early on, he promised a moratorium on oil development in Ecuador's Amazon region. But before long, that proposal gave way to a more complicated proposal. Correa suggested that Ecuador reach out to the international donors and ask them to contribute to a fund that would compensate Ecuador for not developing Yasuni's oil. Would the world pay Ecuador to not drill? It's difficult to say. According to a group of activists that includes Correa's former Minister of Mines and Energy, the Yasuni ITT initiative never had a chance. Correa was undermining Yasuni ITT from day one. The Correa administration disputes this. But when Correa announced the failure of the ITT initiative, a group called the Yasunidos, many of the same people who had supported Correa in the election of 2006, decided the game wasn't over. They collected 750,000 signatures to force a national referendum on the matter. What happened next is in sharp dispute and the subject of our discussion today. Just to put this in context, the oil, the oil in the Yasuni ITT block is the equivalent of about 10 days of global oil demand. I'm going to introduce our speakers now, after which we'll hear a brief presentation from Matt Feiner on the Western Amazon region, its biological importance, and what we can expect to see if oil development actually does go forward in the Yasuni area. And then we'll hear a little bit from Pablo Piedra Vivar about the Yasunidos movement and what they're doing here in Washington, DC. Matt Feiner is from the Amazon Conservation Association. Dr. Feiner investigates threats to the Andean Amazon and works with members of the Amazon Conservation Association to develop strategic responses. Some of the issues he focuses on include palm plantations, oil and gas drilling, road construction, hydroelectric dams, and illegal mining. Prior to joining ACA, he was a project scientist for the Center for International Environmental Law, Sustainable Loreto Project, and a staff ecologist at Save America's Forest. Matt received his PhD from the School of Bio Biological Sciences at Washington State University in 2003. After Matt, we will hear from Pablo Piedra Vivar. Pablo Piedra is legal counsel to the Yasunidos, a civil society group that gathered more than 750,000 signatures on a ref in support of a referendum on whether to drill for oil in the Yasuni National Park. He holds legal degrees from Catholic University in Ecuador, Instituto, Instituto de Empresa in Spain, and the Washington College of Law, where he was a Fulbright scholar. Early in his career, Piedra worked for the United Nations on refugee law and later served as Ecuador's undersecretary for trade in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. In 2012, Piedra co-founded Grand Abogados, a private law firm in Quito, and he also lectures at Universidad de las Americas in Quito. So with that, I'll hand over the time to Matt. Thank you. Yes. Thanks for coming, everybody. And I'm glad this, this map here served as like a nice backdrop, I think, as we all came in. 
Uh, so just to start, so, um, so I'm Matt Finer at a Amazon Conservation Association. And I've been studying this situation in, in Yasuni for way too long, I think more than 10 years now, <laughs> going on past 10 years. Uh, so it's been very fascinating to watch this whole thing evolve. And even my role uh, in the situations evolved a bit as well. Um, so it'll be good for me to be fun to, to walk through. I'll try to walk through like 10 years worth of stuff here in the next couple of minutes. Um, and so I do a mix of both looking at biodiversity issues, um, but also just in terms of development projects. So I'm going to try to combine the two a little bit here. So just the, the quick backdrop here, one of the things that drew me to Yasuni and just the, the Western Amazon as a whole is just this, this is a global biodiversity map of uh, one of my colleagues, Clinton Jenkins, put this together. It's amphibians, birds, and mammals. Um, just, just to give a quick overview, so uh, the, it, re what it represents is going from like blues to yellows, greens to reds to dark, um, just showing the global patterns of biodiversity. And what you can see is where the Yasuni is in that, that dark, dark um, biodiversity, uh, where a lot of biodiversity comes together, the rich, one of the, the, the richest areas in the world for for biodiversity when you look across different types of groups. And uh, to, to put it another way, uh, a map we published uh, a, a couple years ago is it's, at least in terms of the Western Hemisphere, um, what we identified as a, the, an area where, where all these different groups of biodiversity reach their maximum diversity together. So what, what, what this map indicates where the, 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 or the yellow, orange, and reds are where the amphibians, birds, mammals, and plants all have their maximum diversity. And the red is actually like the peak peak of where these groups come together. And in and, um, and, and that area where there is red is basically where, where Yasuni National Park is. So from a biodiversity point of view, Yasuni is pretty special. Um, and I, there's a lot of speculation of why that is. Um, I think we might get into that a little later. But um, I think basically I just chalk it up to it's this unique area where the the Amazon hits the Andes, and it's right at the equator. So you just have all these factors coming together to make it super diverse. And another important um, aspect to point out about the Yasuni area is not only that it has this extraordinary diversity, but it has a, pr a good potential to maintain that diversity in the long term, at least in terms of, of climate change, for example, whereas this map um, basically looking at, at the Amazon as a whole, where the red areas are areas predicted um, to be hit moderate, moderately to um, heavily impacted by climate change, whereas the green areas are predicted to be more of a, uh, areas that have the highest chance of, of having minimal impacts in, in the coming years with climate change. So, so again, so the purple circle indicates basically our area. So the point being is, is the Yasuni is in this area with extremely high biodiversity, but also this potential to maintain biodiversity into the future, at least in terms of climate change, um, which, which is an important thing to think about in terms of like a refuge of Amazonian diversity. OK, so one of the issues, um, one of the development pressures on the, this area, because it is a very remote area, and it doesn't, like, it doesn't have issues like in the Brazilian Amazon with cross-cutting highways and things like that. So in terms of issues or, or development pressures, one of the main ones in this, this, the, this area of, of high biodiversity is, is hydrocarbon, oil and gas development. So this is a map that we published a couple years ago just showing, basically showing the lay of the land in the Western Amazon in terms of the distribution of, of oil and gas concessions or oil and gas blocks, just areas delimited by governments for oil and gas exploration and, and, and development. So the, the areas in yellow are, are these oil concessions, and the area in hash marks are areas that are proposed to be concessions. This, area is a, this map is a couple years old, but it's still, it still gets the point across. It, things, have, things have changed. Pieces have moved around. But for the most part, it just gives a, an, an example that the point being that Yasuni, what hap, what's happening in Yasuni is not necessarily unique in the Amazon. There's, there's a lot of oil and gas activity going on. And so to put us in perspective, so the red there is the, the Yasuni National Park. So again, so now what does make Yasuni unique and different in this whole scenario 
is that it's a national park. And so one interesting thing you can see in the, my pointer's not really working too well, but these, the green areas are national parks. And so you can see, so Peru, for example, um, does not have that overlay between um, oil and gas concessions and national parks. Bolivia, it, there is that going on here in Medidi. Um, so, so as far as I know, Medidi and, and Yasuni in, in Ecuador are, so this whole oil and gas scenario is playing out all over the Amazon, but, but Yasuni is unique in terms of that it's, that it's playing out in a national park. Okay, so now we're going to zoom in. So basically zooming in on that red area here. So this is our, so now this is zooming in on Ecuador specifically, but more our, our the, the, the Yasuni region. So the Yasuni is the green, the green backward C. Um, and it shows the oil blocks. This, we made this map for something else. The, the, red, uh, the red blocks are, are the blocks that belong to the Ecuadorian national company, Petro Ecuador. Um, but it works for this scenario, because I wanted to focus, what we're going to focus on here is the blocks 31 and 43. So 43 is the, the, the ITT block. Um, so this is where we are in that northeast corner of, of Yasuni National Park. And I really just wanted to focus on this map, this scenario. This, this is what we've been really focused on. Um, so again, just going back, so just zoom in on 3143, that's where we are, 31. This is the same thing as 43 ITT. So this is what um, we've been trying to, to wrap our heads around the, the last two years, really, in terms of, of what really is at stake with the ITT initiative. Because I, um, I don't think a lot of people really um, follow the details too much. I think a lot of people, you know, in general terms, follow the the, the, the political situation, but not too many in terms of like what it actually means on, on, on the ground. So what I want to just walk through, so I think this is also a good opportunity to point out that I think there's two, there's two really um, diff, two important and different topics of conversation. Um, I think one is whether there should be any development at all in Yasuni, and a second one is if there is development, how it's going to play out. So I focus now, I used, to, I used to focus more on the first question, but I think I lost that one. And so I've moved on to the second question of, of if development is going to happen, um, how should it be? Now I think Pablo is going to talk about the other scenario of whether there should be development. So I'm glad, I, you know, I'm glad that uh, there are still people fighting. So I just, I just wanted to clarify that, that there's, there's two, two different things. And it's, I, I don't, uh, like, I'm not happy that there's oil development going on in Yasuni or anywhere in the Amazon, but um, assuming that it is going to happen, one of the things that we've been focused on is, is how can it happen, how can we minimize impacts from happening. So it's, it's, it's not necessarily a fun thing to study. <laughs> it, it hurts sometimes, but, but it's important because these projects are happening. Okay, so what I was going to talk about more in terms of like what this development is going to look like assuming it, it moves forward. So. And I can say all that because I fought really hard to stop development in here. <laughs> and I felt like I lost, so I had to move on to do something else. Um, but so what we did for a long time is, is, so the real action was in block 31 for a long time, and now it's more here. Um, but what we did, so back in, um, so just the, on this map, the yellow areas are the, the oil reserves. And the black lines are the access routes. So like a dark black line like this is a road. And this, this map works well too because it shows, it actually doesn't show, there's another road over here that they built in the 80s. And then they built this guy in the 90s. And then this one in the 2000s. So they kept moving east. And so basically in 2003, and basically in 2003, there was the proposal to build this road and develop this oil field. And so by this point, um, like I said, they built, there's been oil development in the 80s and the 90s and then up north there. And so by 2004, this was kind of where there was finally like a big, a big battle about stopping it as, before it got to like the, the um, you know, so there's already impacts in the, the western part of Yasuni and then the central part of Yasuni. And so now we're in the, the northeast Yasuni. And so in 2003-04, there was a, 
there was a huge big fight here. And I, I led that fight, um, trying to, and, and, it was, and it was complicated back then too in terms of like whether the fight was about stopping the development here or just stopping this road because there's a lot of, um, science is pretty thoroughly demonstrated that building roads like this is the big trigger for deforestation, degradation, just impacts that are hard to control. Um, so, so the big fight in 2004, 2005, 6, 7, 8 was to stop this road. It wasn't necessarily to stop. And it was kind of like today. There was, one, there, there was some scientists trying to stop the road, and there was others like Axion Ecologica that were actually trying to stop the whole project. But um, to make a long story short, a really long story really short is in that fight, um, we actually managed to stop this road. Um, the, the environment ministry um, basically at the last second vetoed the, the project and, and, and it was over and we won and it was, a, it, was a, it was a relative success story for a long time that the oil company had to go back to the drawing board and redesign it and come in here with helicopters but not, not build that road. And so frankly I moved on and, and went on to other things and I thought that was over. Um, that we at least have that, that minor victory. Oh, so I meant to highlight that. That's what I was talking about. I don't know if you can see that very well. We could dim the lights a little bit if you can see it. But so in 2012, a National Geographic did a story about Yasuni. And some photographers uh, did an aerial flight and took this picture, which totally blew my mind at the time. So this, this this opening here is this. It's the same, same thing here. So what I didn't know and what I don't think anybody knew is that while we had all moved on, assuming that we, we won that battle, is the Ecuadorian government went back and re, redid some things and changed the plans and, and went ahead with the road after all. So, so basically th this whole issue for us came back to life that they really are building roads again into Yasuni. So that triggered a whole big thing. So this, so this, this, uh, this image is from, I think, like August 2012. And so late last year, we bought high-resolution satellite imagery. And, and this is that same track a year later. So this is, uh, this is September 2003. And basically, so what we documented is it looks like a road, right? Um, this looks like a like a, a drivable surface. If that's how you define a road, and we also saw that big bridge. So this is a waterway, and this is a bridge. So big iron it turned out to be like a, a major iron bridge structure. Which again, to me, a definition of a road is you have these permanent structures to cross water bodies, and we could actually document vehicles. So we released this whole report last year, basically. Uh, crying bloody murder that Ecuador built this new access road into Yasuni. And what's been unfolding now, well what unfolded then and what's unfolding now and what's going to continue to unfold is, is this interesting debate about, about what you call that thing. So, so we call it a, you know, we call it a destructive oil access road, whereas the, the Ecuadorian government is calling it an ecological trail. A, a sendero ecologico, and and so that's that, and that's where we are now, and 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 this is important, and this is like the whole big take-home message of what I'm talking about is, um, so all that's been playing out here, but the the point being is the all these dash lines is what's coming next, and so so all the yellow are the untapped oil fields, and so what's happening now is Ecuador. I haven't read it yet, but I know the environmental impact study just came out for Tiputini, Tambococha. Um, but, you know, they're eventually going to want to come down in here and get this. And they're eventually going to want to come down here and get these reserves in, in Block 31. So, so what we've been arguing is, is if Ecuador was allowed to go ahead and build what we're calling just a traditional oil access road here, although they're calling it an ecological trail, to us it looks like a road is that's basically just setting up the precedent for just moving 
deeper into the park here and into here. And that's problematic for a number of reasons from our point of view, just in terms of we're talking about the, the core, you know, we're really talking about the core of Yasuni at this point. And another issue is down in here is the zone intangible. Maybe you'll talk about that a little bit more. But an area that was uh, set aside, well, basically put off limits to oil development. So, so they started with a national park, which is off limits to hydrocarbon activities. But then they changed things around in a new constitution that you can do it. So then here's another, another designation called the zone intangible where you really can't go do extractive activities. And so just the, one of the things that we've been emphasizing is just building these new roads right to the doorstep of the zone intangible for, for uncontacted indigenous groups um, is, is, is very problematic, is troubling. Um, so, and I think I'll just end it at this, is this, this is just um, a map we created based on, on information we got that the Ecuadorian government produced where the the blue circles are the planned drilling platforms. And just again, just so the, the, from the plans that we've seen, the idea really is to base, so this is the limit of the zone in Tenhible, is to really to go to the, the basically the, to the limit. So, so I think we're really looking at a, a major extension. So, so I think the, all this talk about ITT and, and what really what's at stake is it's not really a, a nibbling around the edges of Yasuni, but really, um, really looking at development really into the, the, the core of the park. And that's why we've been, really focused on, on, okay, if this development really is going to happen, um, how's it going to go? And we're at least of the opinion that, that um, at least if you go in with helicopters and not build these access roads, that's, that's better than, than, than having these access roads. So it, it's definitely a tricky position. I know it's not easy, but, but that's basically where we've been. Um, all right. I'll, I guess I'll stop there. I have this other thing that I can talk about. Stop there or do it? What's that? Stop? Yeah, I think we're okay, cool. Okay. This is this this will be my next talk. This thing here, we can do it in Q and A. Okay, doing Q and A. Okay, cool. Great, thanks. thanks. Yep. Thank you. <coughs> oh, his slides next. Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Pablo Piedra. I am. Um, I come here to talk um, as a Yasunidos uh, member with my other colleague, Patricia Carrion, who is accompanying me in the room. Uh, we've come to Washington to present a petition against the um, Ecuadorian government because uh, of the violation of our political rights, as, that, as I'm going to explain later on, is uh, 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 linked to this ecological problem. I'll tell you why later. But first, I wanted to show you a video about a uh, really small video about uh, the Yasunidos movement, and um, uh, afterwards, I'll uh, I'll take it from there. So uh, I don't know. Can there it is? Perfect.
Yo. 20 balas encima y todavía vivo Pila de tropezones y todavía camino Me han quitado la luz Y aún miro cuántos golpes en el pecho Y todavía respiro 20 balas encima y todavía vivo Pila de tropezones y todavía camino Me han quitado la luz Y aún miro cuántos golpes en el pecho Y todavía respiro Vamos a dar un poco de educación a los niños para que crezcan sanos, fuertes y sin el vil egoísmo A los que creen que es el cáncer este lo más bonito Pues que sepan que los hombres no se hacen a tiros Si quieren ser matones no voy a impedirlo Si quieren ser muy malos pues que elijan su destino Yo me mantengo en la conciencia y en la plena consecuencia En el camino libertario yeah. que forja yeah. la decencia Las primeras cinco en las manos y en los pies Descubriendo el mundo en el que voy a crecer Tratando de entender el motivo de mis movimientos Tratando de saber el porqué de mis pensamientos Recogiendo información dentro de mi cabeza La cual me servirá en la vida que recién empieza Diez acciones, diez problemas, diez soluciones Sensaciones, discusiones, diferentes emociones Diversiones, sentimientos encontrados con roces Específicamente sobre la bala 14 Por eso aquí se ve el resultado de lo que he vivido de Yo firmo por el Yasuní Yo firmo por el Yasuní yo firmo por el Yasuní. 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 Yo firmo por el
uh, and after, after the, 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 they started to, to build these roads, then they asked permission for the, for the general, for, to, the, to the assembly. So in Ecuador, there's a saying that it's better to, to, to say uh, sorry than to ask for permission. That's what they did. And, um, and in August 15, when the president announced that he was going to exploit the, the, the Yasuni National Park, hundreds of people, thousands of people, uh, went to the streets and, uh, I'm sorry, but it's a little bit emotional, though, and uh, announced that, they, uh, that, that, that they're, 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 they're not in favor of, what, of, of the president's decision. And started to, to see what was the, the best way to, to, to prevent, to stop this, uh, this, this from happening. And uh, the, um, the solution was that uh, we, we, we would have to call for a referendum. We would have to call for a referendum. And because that, 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 that was the challenge that the president put on uh, amongst all these people in, uh, from society, these women, children, uh, young people that went out on the streets to say, well, collect the firms, collect the firms. And if you, uh, and if you held a referendum and you win, we won't drill. And uh, so people started to organize themselves like that. And Yasunidos came to birth. It came to birth to protect Yasuni, not, not to withheld a referendum, but to protect Yasuni. Re uh, the, the referendum was just uh, the, the tool to protect Yasuni. And uh, we started, well, they started a campaign. I, I, I joined them in the, in the road like many other people did. This movement is, it, it doesn't have any electoral pr purposes, is not affiliated to any political party. It, it's, it's, it, 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 it gathers together architects, engineers, students, doctors, lawyers, bi uh, uh, people from all over society. And, um, and uh, in, in, in these efforts, well, when, when governments started to see that these efforts were, were, were gaining momentum, it, they launched a propaganda uh, uh, campaign in order to stop these efforts, mocking, smearing, the people in Yasunidos, um, and also launching parallel initiatives with their political allies in order to, to uh, gain support from civil society, also in order to exploit Yasuni. So w while we were gathering, uh, we were looking for to, to gather more than 500,000 uh, signatures, the, the, the government launched another initiative to also to confuse people and to say, uh, to support the exploitation with, of course, everything done with public resources. Um, and from the, from the first beginning, Yasunidos uh, uh, encountered a series of unconstitutional and illegal obstacles and blockades. Day one, the, constitu the, the, con the Constitutional Court is, has to qualify the question that you are going to ask in referendum to see if it's constitutional or not. So Yasunidos went to the Constitutional Court and said, OK, is this co question constitutional? And what did the court say? It didn't qualify it. It just said, you first gather the signatures, and then you come to me, which is ridiculous and also unconstitutional. Why ridiculous? Because who's going to waste money, uh, effort, and resources in order to collect 500,000 signatures and then go to the constitutional court? And so they would say, oh, it's unconstitutional. Sorry, thanks for participating. Try again. Uh, but still, Yasunidos moved on. And in a... In a incredible effort, we collected more than 750,000 signatures. That, and we presented this to the uh, independ independent, uh, uh, supposedly independent, uh, electoral institution in Ecuador in order to qualify these signatures and to uh, uh, accept the referendum. And the obstacles and the illegal, illegal and ar arbitrary decisions from, from the state started again to build up. What did they do? They designed a process in order to, uh, not to guarantee our constitutional right to, to call for a referendum, but a process designed to, um, uh, designed to nullify, to invalidate the, 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 the most uh, quantity of, of signatures collected. So 
uh, when we presented the signatures, they had all this process, which is illegal, which is unconstitutional, uh, and they, they nullified more than 60% of the signatures we presented. So why? Why did they, they, they nullify them? Not because we didn't uh, uh, present the signatures or the signatures we present were false, but because the paper we present, we, we, we collected the, the signatures, wasn't in the format that supposedly the, the institution uh, uh, had to approve. It was like three millimeters, mi millimeters uh, uh, shorter, or because you signed, if you're, if you're called Levi uh, T Tilleman, right? That's your, that's your last name. And you, you, you're, you were supposed to put Tilleman Levi. And if you put it backwards, then it was, it, 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 it was uh, unvalid, right? If, if, you, if you signed with, with, with a, a black pen or a red pen instead of a blue pen, it was unvalid, no? So, and uh, these are just a few examples of what happened. But on, a, on, a, on, 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 on this procedure that was put upon the first citizen's initiative to collect firms to, to, to withheld a referendum, since, because Ecuador has a new constitution, uh, in 2008, people uh, approved a new constitution. And since that constitution, this was going to be the first citizen's initiative to call upon a referendum. And what did government do? They created this procedure not to guarantee our constitutional right, but to prevent us from calling upon a referendum. So uh, uh, after this, after, I mean, weeks of protesting and, and, uh, uh, and troubles we, we, we managed, the, the, uh, 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 the, the constitutional electoral, uh, um, I mean, the electoral institution in Ecuador uh, denied us our right. And we, uh, withhold, I mean, try to, to have a, a legal battle in Ecuador. But we saw that all the institutions that were uh, created supposedly to guarantee our rights were not uh, doing their, their, their constitutional job, but they were or orchestrating uh, and they were um, working in, um, in, in, in order to obtain the objective of the central government, courts that supposed to be are, should be independent. The electoral institution is supposed to be independent. They all um, worked uh, hand in hand with the central government in order to blockade this. So we didn't have any response. And now we, it's, so we, um, we ended our legal battle there. And uh, uh, some say we, 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 we lost. But now we're here in Washington, D.C., and we've presented a petition against the Inter-American Commission for Human Rights in order to to uh, recognize this violation of the state, you know? um, and uh, also seeking for support from organizations, uh, uh, international and citizens f from here, the U USA, to, to keep fighting for this and keep uh, 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 letting our voice be heard on, on these international forums. In order for, for, for the, uh, 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 taking out the mask of the, of, uh, of the Ecuadorian government and, um, and everybody, uh, so everybody can know that in, in Ecuador there is no rule of law right now and uh, that the most biodiverse place on earth, which is home to these indigenous tribes that, that are isolated from Western civilization, uh, not be uh, exterminated from from the planet because of this of this oil oil exploitation there so I think my time is up but I think we have questions and answers I just wanted to show you a, a small video 40 seconds it's going to be in Spanish but I'll translate it to you this is the guy you're going to see here is the president from the electoral authority in Ecuador and he uh, uh, went on a, on a national TV network and uh, and said what you, you're, you're going to hear t right now so I don't know. Let's hit play. Okay. I'll translate you everybody. Yo pienso que crear un infierno para recoger, para recoger firma no es lo correcto. So if, if we can pause there. Eh, El impacto. Okay. If this is the, 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 the president of, of, the, of the electoral organization in Ecuador. He's called Domingo Paredes. And he's there in National Network with a... With a a paper, reading a paper, and saying, I think, what he says, and I quote, I think that 
creating a hell in order to collect signatures to support and prevent the, uh, the exploitation for Yasuni is a, is a mistake. And um, that's what he says right now. So he's, he's saying that Yasunidos is creating a, a hell and, 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 and saying whatever in order to collect words, uh, signatures and that he thinks that's not correct. He, he, that's not his position, right? He's just there to guarantee an a, a, a independent procedure, but he's taking a position for the government right now. So play, please. In an activity like the destruction of hydrocarbures, no tiene esta dimension of 100,000 hectares. It's el 0.01% of the total area total that will be affected, yes, in a manner regulated or minima for the activity of extractivist. Okay. So what, what's he saying there? He says, it, 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 the, the, the harm on Yasuni is only, only going to be 0.01%. Not, not a, it's, it, it's, there's going to be an impact, but it's going to be very little. What, why, why are these people making the, uh, all this fuss about if it's going to be so little, the, the, the harm in Yasuni? Yo pienso que esta segunda falacia debería ser corregida. Judge and jury. Domingo Paredes, judge and jury. So this is just an example of what the, uh, uh, the independent institutions, how the independent institutions were acted in this procedure. Okay, so thank you. Thank you. Great, thank you. So I'd like to invite uh, both of you to come up on stage now, and we're going to have a brief discussion uh, with both Matt and Pablo, and then we'll take questions from the audience. Well, first of all, I want to thank both of you for being here. That was a very illuminating discussion. And I um, especially want to thank the Yasunidos, who are working on these important issues against huge odds um, and against a lot of um, intimidation from the, the government. But, but I, I want to ask you, Pablo, you know, what, what the government of Ecuador would say about the situation. We invited the ambassador or a representative from the embassy to join us, um, and unfortunately, they were not able to attend. But what would, what would their perspective be on, on the Yasunidos claims against them at the ICHR? Well, they have two, they, they have two um, speeches. No? One uh, for the ecological impact. They'll, they'll say that uh, the old companies will use the um, most advanced procedures in order to prevent any harm from, from, from being caused. And, for, uh, and this, I have to be clear. Uh, Yasuni, uh, uh, the, uh, sorry, the um, Petroecuador, which is a state-owned company, and Petromazonas, which is its affiliate, has the worst uh, uh, oil spilling record in Ecuador. I mean, it's caused the, the, the most oil spilling in, in, in the country. And uh, second of all, you can see that these ecological trails with Matt presented are not ecological trails. They're just changing the words in order to confuse people and creating roads on the most biodiverse uh, uh, park in, in, in the world. So they'll say that there's not going to be any impact done. And then second of all, uh, uh, from what the, uh, uh, I mean, the violation of our constitutional rights, they, 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 what, what they are saying is that we didn't uh, comply with the re legal requirements of, of Ecuadorian law, and that's, because that, that's why we didn't have the referendum. And that's not true because uh, the, the constitutional and legal requirements were uh, changed by administration resolutions that, uh, that um, created obstacles in order for this referendum to be withheld. And that's what the International Human, uh, the Inter-American Human Rights Commission is going to find when they study and um, they, um, they treat this, this case. Interesting. Um, and so, a little bit of background here. Uh, President Rafael Correa came to power, um, he was elected in 2006, came to power in 2007, and one of the first things he did was rewrite the Constitution of Ecuador. And one of the things that he put in that new Constitution was that the natural world would have rights. They legally enshrined the rights of the natural world um, in this Constitution. Um, so, so it was kind of a shock for some of his supporters I'm sure when he started pushing uh, very aggressively for oil development in Yasuni. Can you, can you tell us a little bit you know, how you all felt when 
uh, the, the champion that you felt you had in the administration uh, started to, to push for, for development of Yasun National Park? Well, uh, I think Matt can also tell his perspective upon what this na nature rights meant at the beginning, because I think from a biological point of view, it's interesting. Maybe you have something, maybe you're not to say. But for us, I mean, it was a total betrayal. I mean, total betrayal from part of the government that um, was elected and in a collective platform in order to protect these uh, nature rights. Uh, uh, the Constitution of Ecuador is supposed to be one of the only constitutions in the world who, who portrays na nature having rights. Uh, what, what does this mean is that if, uh, if, um, uh, if nature is being harmed anywhere, any person could, could, uh, could act upon, uh, among, uh, as, uh, I mean, uh, the guardian of, of nature, and um, claim a violation of its rights. You know? so, uh, but what, what happens in, in, in so reality? How did that work? In, I mean, it, what was the idea when they put that into the Constitution? Well, it, first of all, recognize the, the, the co cosmovision of the uh, indigenous tribes and, uh, uh, and, and the people who live in Ecuador who think that nature is a living thing. And it's not a, a thing, it's not an object, it lives, it has life for itself. Not because of us, it's not, it doesn't serve it, humans, it's, it, it, has, it, it, has, it has life for itself. And it, it, this would make much more easier to protect harm, harm, uh, harm doing on, on, on nature for itself. You know, that, that was the idea. But what happened in, in, in reality is that the, um, the thirst for resources in Ecuador was so big that this was an obstacle in order to gain more resources, in order to, 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 to keep on growing the, the political movement and the political uh, support of Rafael Correa. So he, in, in practice, what he, they did is um, uh, they, 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 they don't let effectively the protection, they, 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 they don't let the, the, the nature rights effectively being protected, but they just uh, put them aside in order to uh, give a free way to, to these um, projects like oil drilling and mining, et cetera. So I want to come back to that in a second. But uh, first, I want to go to Matt and ask you a little bit more about these roads. You know, so we've, we've heard a, a lot about roads and you know, the focus on building roads into these pristine and uninhabited regions of the National Park. But could you explain a little bit more, why are roads such a big focus? Why are they so important? You know, what is the scientific literature that demonstrates that roads will somehow irreparably harm the rainforest? OK. And I, I also, <laughs> if I'm allowed, I also I wanted to touch on, on the previous question as well, if, if, if I could, just because um, uh, I can get to that in a second. Just, but I just wanted to add. Uh, because I, I feel I have a different, a bit of a different take on the whole, uh, just so watching the whole Yasuni ITT. I think I'm one of the few people on the planet that doesn't vilify President Correa um, that much. Because I, I, I really do think that, because it played out for a long time. When did they launch? It was like 2007. And, and they didn't pull the plug until 2013. So it went on for a long time. And, and um, I, like I said, I think I'm one of the few people in the world that thinks that Correa actually gave it a fair shot and and because um, they actually went through three cycles I think of, 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 of teams in charge of this Yasuni ITT initiative and uh, I think all the, 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 the people speculating that it was just um, just like a ruse just to kind of buy some time to do it I think Korea had so many opportunities to, to, to pull the plug and be like hey I tried um, but he didn't do that, and he kind of constituted a new team, and then a new team, and, and the teams were, le were legit. And so I, I defend Correa in terms of, of um, and I don't vilify him, and, and, and I think the, the Asuni ITT initiative was, was real. I think a lot of people don't think it was real. Um, I think it was real, and I think if, if, if a lot of countries really stepped up, you know, and he went, I mean, they, they, they created a, a whole trust fund at the UN. I mean, why would he do that if this wasn't a real deal? And so I think, so I, I just try to get that out because I, I think sometimes there's some over vilification of, of, of Korea. So, so I, think, I think the Yasuni ITT initiative was real, but I, I guess what, what did shock me was when they did pull the plug um, is how quickly Korea vilified the people that kept defending it. That, 
that was weird because it's like, okay, so so they were on the they were basically arguing the same thing for seven years, and then he changed, and then and then so really what what shocked me was just was just that vilification of of folks that that were basically kept arguing that same line that hey there's a lot of biodiversity and that that was the shocking twist for me but so so I, I think that's important to 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 to, to put in the context um, that that I do think Cray was was trying to make this work for a long time and it it, it just didn't happen but but that that switch at the end was was weird um, what was the question roads um, so roads so roads I, I just uh, I just steal lines from uh, a scientist guy, William Lawrence, that's written a lot about roads. And he has a good line that he repeats every five minutes. He likes it, but I, I, it's a good line. He's just like, roads are just the Pandora's box. It's just like, once you build it and it's there, it's just like, you don't know what's, what's going to happen. Um, they're, just, they're just very hard to control. And so when you're, and, and I think the, um, the, the important thing to point out is the, not just Yasuni, but the whole oil and gas scenario across the Western Amazon, is a lot of the development is, is um, happening in really, really remote areas where other economic sectors, they don't have the resources to go in there. So, so the, the oil and gas sector is really the, the only industry in there. And so, and so, and what they, how they, and so them being there and inserting these roads just, just, just really has the potential to open up the area, okay. and and you know, and I will admit, even this whole thing with the ecological trail versus the road is tricky, just because it's not, because it's not a road road. It's not it's not like hooked up to the interstate system, and and you know, just your average trucker guy can go down there. It's not. I I, I admit, it's not like that. There's there's it's not connected to the road system. There's a gate, so there, it's definitely a fine line between what is a road. And 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 what is this ecological trail saying? But, but at the end of the day, our position is 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 your is is. I mean, there's just a lot of scientific literature out there that roads are the number one trigger of of just opening up an area for for and 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 it. And so what we have been looking at, you know, is is the deforestation patterns on on the existing roads. Okay. And what we do see is even the road that they built in the 90s that does have a control point. Um, there is way less deforestation than the other roads without the control points, but but it has opened up the area, and and there is colonization, there is deforestation, and and the bigger picture too is 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 20 years down the road, 30 years down the road, because uh, it's easy to say, and they always say it that when we leave, we're we're gonna shut down the road and take it with us, but you know the the big question is are how feasible is that going to be if if the road starts to get, because the other, the tricky factor is these roads are built in indigenous territories where the Warani are, and so, um, I mean, so you can control like a colonist coming in, they can't come in, but it's very hard to control indigenous groups colonizing the road. And so, uh, you know, it, it's, it's, it's not to the extreme of, of it's not like a road with like truckers going down it that's going to colonize everything, but, but at the same time you are just building these pathways in the super pristine forest, and, and it's just dangerous. And pretty much at the end, and, and, and the thing is, is, though, there are precedents in other parts of the Amazon, in southern Peru and in Ecuador, that you can do this development without building a road. It, it's possible. You can go in with helicopters, or you can do like monorail systems. And so it's just, it's not necessary, so, so why, why take the risk? Thank you. So, so Matt answered your question, Pablo. So do you have anything to add on roads? I just figure that's <laughs> no, fair. I, um, I think, it, I think it's, it, it's kind of fair. I mean, I'll, I'll, I'll stay with, with what Matt said at, at the end. It's how weird is it that the, people, the same people who voted for him, who supported him, were, are now, uh, as, as he portrayed it, uh, yesterday, the garbage of, the political, of polit politics in Ecuador. So, so we should explain this. <laughs> um, the Yasunidos went and they just presented this claim against the Ecuadorian government at the um, Inter-American Commission on Human Rights. And Correa, um, who uh, has a big personality, you might say, promptly got on the airwaves and called them the garbage of Ecuador. Um, and so you know, this is not a man who pulls his punches. But what, what were you saying? So um, I mean, it's not, a, it's not a matter of Correa or not Correa. It's a matter of his government, right? Correa. It gained, it went into power with a political platform that supported this idea. 
And during the first years, this idea was strong because he as himself wasn't strong enough to, to um, uh, make his own arguments the arguments of, of his government. So he had to be democratic with the ministries who supported him. Uh, you, you see people like Alberto Acosta or Van der Falconi or, or other people who, who were, uh, Yolanda Cacabatze, who were, who were pushing for this initiative at, at first, right? Or, um, citizens' organizations about the Yasunita death. But when he started, and, and there's, there are, if, if you go dive into the political history of the last eight years, you see these important uh, meetings that were held in Petroecuador where there was th these, fierce debates about what to do in Yasuni. And, 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 and for a long time, the, the arg argument of not exploring the Yasuni won. But also, the other argument had hit its plan B. And Correa always talked about this plan B. So he, yes, of course, he created this fund, this trust fund, and in, in supposedly created the trust fund with in, in, in United Nations. But the day they were going to sign the, 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 the trust fund in, in United Nations, he pulled his, his support, and as a consequence, the former Ministry of, 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 uh, former in, uh, of International Affairs, Van der Falconi, renounced because of that. Because uh, he didn't understand how the government uh, changed his, his, their ideas from one day to another. So you had these messages, these me mixed messages all along. Exploit or not exploit, exploit or not exploit. And of course, he didn't plug out the, 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 plug, plug out the idea of, of of ITT until the last year, but throughout these eight years, his position was uh, wasn't as clear enough also to support and and give the international trust that this wasn't going to happen. That there he wasn't there weren't we weren't going to receive the money, and just five years later decide to exploit Yasuni. So so, so let me just recap what you said. Essentially, when Correa came to government, he didn't have a very strong base of support. Uh, that was his own. And exactly. So he had to placate his various supporters who were the Minister of Mines and Energy, mm -hmm. Alberto Acosta, other supporters from the youth movements. And so he kept supporting the, the um, Yasuni ITT initiative. But as soon as he had his own base of power, you're saying he pulled out. Of yeah, the, the, the last elections he won, and his vice president was the, was, is right now the, in charge of all this strategic. Uh, projects which uh, are around mining, oil, and uh, other big money projects. So when he won the last election, that was in 2012, um, the agenda against the Sunni was al al already defined. Nobody in his cabinet had the strength, political strength, to, uh, to change the, 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 the idea of exploiting Yasuni. In 2013, when he said, well, how much money have, have, we, have we earned about this? Oh, a couple of millions, then we're going to exploit the money. And that same day, or that same week, uh, the vilification that Ahmed has portrayed was fierce against everybody, everyone who um, opposed this decision. And it goes until now. Everybody who opposes the, the Yasuni exploitation is an enemy. Mm -hmm. And you cannot hear anybody in his own party talking about not exploiting the Yasuni because immediately they would be out of their party, out of their seats, even though if they were elected by their own, their own terms. Mm -hmm. and, and there's a very interesting uh, background on this. So I was down in Ecuador in, in August, and I spoke to a bunch of different people from different backgrounds on, on the topic of the Yasuni initiative. And you know, I found everyone from international oil men to far-left groups like the Yasunidos saying essentially the same thing, which is that Correa from the beginning was not particularly enthusiastic about the environmental side of the left-wing agenda that he had come to power on. You know, he really understood the, the idea of, uh, of directing more of society's resources to um, Ecuador's lower classes, but in terms of environmental protection, that was not his personal priority. Um, and I, I had an interesting discussion with a gentleman named René Ortiz, who used to be the Secretary General of OPEC. And you know, the thing that really shocked me was 
the story that he told was almost the exact same story that you told me uh, when I was in Ecuador, which is that there was kind of this internal rift within the administration. Um, actually, even before Correa had won his second round of the presidential election, he asked Correa Ortiz to organize these meetings with the international oil companies and to start that pivot towards developments. And so um, you, know, you, you definitely hear a variety of opinions as to whether the Yasuni ITT initiative was you know, a sham from the very beginning or whether it was kind of best efforts. Um, but it seems uh, from the people I spoke with that, that the president was not particularly dedicated to uh, the environmental side of his agenda. So what, I, what I'd like to do now is open up the discussion to questions from the audience. And um, if you can just raise your hand, tell us who you're with or who you're representing. And um, I, will, I will call on you and we'll pass around a microphone. Yes, please, in the green shirt. I'm Emily Goldman, and I work with um, a variety of human rights organizations, including Matt, um, and environmental protection agencies or organizations that work with indigenous people. And I'm just curious about the changing of the maps. Was this part of your um, what you presented to the Interment Commission? Because that's pretty big to change the maps so that it looks like the uncontacted are like here instead of here, so that justifies. And also, like, what did what did the government say? or you know in general to that to that you know. well the the um, th that part of the argument i mean as many others the ecological part of the argument is not the main i mean the main part of the art a uh, petition against the government uh, in the inter-american court why because uh, in order to to have um i mean if in order for you to p uh, present a petition against the inter-american court you have to uh, uh, um, uh, overcome uh, uh, the procedures inside your country. So this is mainly a political rights uh, claim against the Inter-American Court. And it's, it, it, it serves to, to, uh, to, per to portray the government as it is in, in the democratic sense. But the thing happening with the um, indigenous tribes in Yasuni is a, a, a really other matter. I mean, and it's, of course, probably the most important thing to do but uh, there's uh, uh, still legally uh, s things that we have uh, th th there has to be done in Ecuador before going in internationally to uh, other courts. So, uh, so Pablo, what, what you're saying is you have to tell the Inter-American Commission on Human Rights mm -hmm. that you have tried to pursue all possible legal paths mm -hmm. within your own country before they will hear a case, exactly. is that right? So that's what happens with our, with our political uh, rights case. But in case of, um, I mean, what happens with the indigenous tribes in Yasuni could lead to genocide uh, there. Uh, of course, they're not millions, they're not thousands of millions, they're not thousands probably, but, they're, but, but they are uh, 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 tribes, uh, hundreds of people living from, from before Columbus arrived to America. Uh, and if we have contact with them, they could be exterminated. Can, can, you, can you explain, Matt, what has happened in the past when oil workers and um, other people have come into contact with these uh, Horani tribes who are living in self-imposed isolation? I, I mean, I'm not a super expert on this topic at all, but just there's just a long, there's just a long history of, 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 of deadly contact. And I mean, I think the only thing to really point out is, is uh, I mean, these tribes really are, I mean, it's, it's, it's the real deal, 100% uncontacted. And, and when there is contact, it's, it's not, you know, it, 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 it's lethal. Um, so I, yeah, I, don't, I don't really have anything too specific to add other than there is a long history, including recent history in terms of, and, and some of the more recent ones have been in terms of, 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 of loggers even, just an illegal loggers. So just any sort of, just any sort of, of, of penetration to where they are uh, just is, is deadly contact. So it does seem like there is a very clear defending of, 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 of their territory. And, as I understand it, these are tribes that are very territorial. They're fiercely independent. They don't like the idea of other people coming in and, opposing, and imposing on their will to live as they want to live. And as soon as uh, people start cutting down their trees and harvesting 
uh, their monkeys and other sorts of bush meat. Um, that's what they feel is happening. And so what happens is they then attack these external influences with you know, spears and um, frequently they are killed in return. Well, and the most, I mean, the most recent thing, what was it, 2013? Yeah. Was, was when the, the, the deadly conflict actually went between the uncontacted groups and the Warani themselves, where the, the uncontacted, how did it go? They, they killed a Warani. Well, it's, it's a very interesting story. And then the Warani counterattacked. And was yeah, people say, people say that it all started with a helicopter uh, throwing a, um, a Coke, a canned Coke. In the in the in, in these parts of the jungle, uh, that's the story. I've I've heard it's more interesting. We cannot. And one of the one of the, like the one of the one of the from the gods must be crazy. Yeah. <laughs> so so no so so someone drink this and was killed, right? Because uh, it's not we're not doing propaganda against Coca Cola here, but mm -hmm. that's what majorly happens with, with with this. So when these people saw the can, they saw that it, it, this Waurani, which was the link between the contacted and not contacted, it had the, these these instruments in his house, right? So he, they linked both and they killed him and his wife. So the, 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 the family of this guy uh, sought revenge and sought revenge as they traditionally do, but using modern instruments. So they went in not with spears, but with semi-automatic machine guns or, and, and guns. They localized these, these Tarayi and Taramenani tribes and killed a dozen of them. So, so um, just to and they took two, two little little girls from them also because that's the. the, the there are these tribes of Ho Horani, which are a broader group, and then there are different groups of Horani, and some of the Horani have actually become modernized or you know, so somewhat. Um, I, is modernized? That's probably the wrong word to use. Would you say modernized? What would you say they've? They have adopted Western civilization to greater or lesser extents, uh, but some of them are living in complete isolation. And so what you have here is a, a conflict between some groups that have adopted Western civilization to a greater extent and have procured Western guns and arms and then gone back and used a more traditional uh, form of score settling and slaughtered the ones who have not adopted Western exactly. civilization. So this, this all happens, I mean, uh, why? Because, because of the, uh, of the um, uh, uh, pressure the, that civilization has on their territory. I mean, as, as more as we go advanced in the, in the forest, in the Amazon forest, th the more pressure th 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 we put on them. And uh, places where they collected traditionally their food or where they lived because they're, they're nomads, right? And now they see people that they didn't see before or, imp or damage that they didn't see before. So they, they see that this is a, 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 as violence and they're going to act violently and they're going to receive violent response also. So this is why Constitution uh, protects their territories. No, no oil drilling or any e extraction activity should be done in these, in, in these territories. What did they do in order to let the, these territories be done? Change the maps of where they passed. So say, oh yeah, there was supposed to be a pass. We saw or we've heard these people being there, here. So then they erase them and they say, no, no, there's nothing here. They're just farther around. And on Block 31, that's why they uh, resumed the, the, the exploitation there, because uh, there shouldn't be any exploitation in Block 31. Do we have any other questions from the audience in the back? Hi, uh, I'm Will Durbin. I work at the World Bank, but I'm here just because I'm interested. Um, I'm wondering two questions. One is, has anyone either successfully or unsuccessfully brought a case in Ecuador using the uh, nature has inherent rights? Uh, have there been any, like what's the legal, what's the jurisprudence on that? And then um, secondly, with the regard to the um, Inter-American Commission on Human Rights, you know, do you expect even if you, you know, win the case, uh, you know, the problem is getting the implementation on the Ecuador, or on the government who's lost the case, getting them to actually do something about it. Um, you know, what kind of sticks and carrots do you have to, th what do you hope happens if, if you guys do win? First of all, yes, there's been a couple of cases since the new constitution was, was um, uh, adopted. One in, in a region called Vilcabamba in Loja, where, um, where a, a person uh, claimed a, a river that was being uh, damaged 
and um, they claim the rights of nature and a judge in the uh, su you know, superior court, which is like similar to the federal court, uh, to the state court here, um, upheld, uh, said that the upheld the rights and, and, and they won. But it was one of the first cases when everybody was very uh, enthusiastic by, this, by th these rights. And then we haven't seen many cases like this happen again because there's a real big pressure from the executive power and the ju judicial power stopping these cases from, from, from being upheld, right? So never, never again. But uh, you might see a judge willing to do this if there is no government interest in, uh, in the particular area. So what is this money being used for? You know, they're developing oil in the ITT block. You know, theoretically, some sort of revenues are coming from that. Um, why is the government so dead set on extracting um, this oil? And, and, and what, is, what is ultimate destination for these well, revenues? Uh, first, uh, I know we're going, but just to, to finish the, um, the friend's question, we, we seek to keep in the na political agenda nationally and internationally the Yasuni uh, initiative. No? Power changes. There are shifts of power every time. And we hope that the next shift of power comes also with a uh, stop of the, of the Yasuni uh, the drilling, uh, the Yasuni exploitation, right? Or to create uh, sufficient support in this, in, in, in this government to stop it. The International uh, uh, Commission for the uh, Inter-American Commission for Human Rights is in probably not I I going to take a long time, no. But um, it's important for us to to legitimize our, our claims and say the, the state violated these rights, and it, it, it's also important for us to keep it on the on the agenda in order to keep discussing around this nationally, internationally, gain gain support, and. Um, uh, and slow down the, the impact on Yasuni. Even if they start, I mean, in the worst case scenario, even if they start exploiting it, the, as long as the exploitation goes on through time, the, the deeper the impact will be. If, if you stop it uh, uh, earlier, the impact will be, will, will be less. So um, our, our main cause is to save Yasuni. And we're doing not only this, uh, this right now, but there's uh, other, uh, other initiatives uh, that nationally we're, are, are, we're trying to organize in order to stop this. And Levi was telling, wh where is all this funds going to come? Well, it's interesting because the government, the same government has said that the revenues from the oil in the Yasuni is not going to be for them. Why? Because the, 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 expo the, the, the exploitation is going to be in 2017 and supposedly President Correa is not going to be in power at that time because he can't be reelected. Of course, he is now trying to reform constitution in order to, for him to be reelected as number as time and possible. And with an electoral uh, institution like that, we can have a, a lot of Correa for a long time. You know? But um, supposedly he doesn't go for re-election. Correa all the time. Right? Yeah, because, yeah. Because, because Correa, from the first beginning, uh, he said, I'm not, going to, I, I'm, I'm not interested in being in power uh, forever. Uh, I think in, in, in the alternation of power, I think a, a, pre a president should change. Uh, that was his, 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 uh, his first speeches, right? Now he says, well, uh, the alternation of power is a bourgeois uh, speech from the French Revolution. Now, I mean, he changes his, 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 uh, his speech when I, whatever, for whatever reasons. But um, that, supposedly he doesn't, he's not in power. So where is Yasuni money going to go if it's not going? Why is he so so interested in 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 in, in exploiting Yasuni? Well, because m m most of the re of the of the um, uh, of the of the money he's re receiving in loans or or he's anticipating the the um, the sell of oil to the Chinese companies to to China, he's receiving money uh, selling the futures of oil. No? So he sells uh, 100,000 barrels that we're going to exploit in, in a year. No? He says he puts out it as, as an anticipated sale of oil, but it's a, it's a loan. So it's a loan, and you're guaranteeing it with future oil. No? So he needs more money, you know? and the Chinese 
say, well, we need more oil. And, and, and what is the money that they're collecting going towards? I'm, as well, I understand, there's a huge build out of infrastructure yes. in Ecuador right now. That's a major yes. initiative in, in, of infrastructure, the Correa administration. He says, he says it's going to give us develop the development we have and had in, in years. But it's really debatable. And that's an economic question. Maybe you can, uh, you can help us answer <laughs> in another, in another, point, in another uh, forum. But, but of course, he's saying it's for infrastructure. But there is a question about how, how they're, if they're really using uh, the prices are, are inflated for every, uh, every one of these projects. There is a question about corruption. There is a question about, um, about strengthening his political basis. No, by a populistic and clientelistic approach. No, so he needs more money to give more jobs directly from government, uh, and to sustain himself in power. What what have you seen in terms of the growth of government in Ecuador in the last six years since Correa became president? It's huge. I mean, you have minister, uh, uh, dozens of ministry created in this in, in this government. Mm -hmm. You, we cannot say that, that, that the social impact of, uh, of this government is, is, is small. It has been really big. It's important. Don't get me wrong. But many people also say that it, it should be more efficient. You know, uh, I, I was discussing with a friend. He, he has, he, I mean, I've seen, pro probably you've seen President Obama uh, uh, go through streets here in Washington with a big, you know, amount of security and guards and everything. Well, in Ecuador, I mean, the difference between President Correa and President Obama shouldn't be as different. No? Even though we, we are like a much smaller country, he, he moves in seven land cruisers uh, and all his, 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 his movement of himself should be like more than a million dollars. And he always says, one, a school of the millennium, the, which are these really modern and big schools, cost a million dollars. So they're asking me to give up these monies in order to, to, to not to build a, a, a hundreds of, of, of millennial schools. Well, he drives in a millennial school each day to his house and to his work, to his office. And you see, like, the, the, the buy, buying airplanes. Buying, so there is a, a, some people argue, me and myself, that there is a, not a good use of public money. No, and that's what we're financing with, with, with oil right now. Are there any other questions from the audience? Uh, so I think you were first. Um, okay, I have two completely different questions. Um, my first question is um, for Matt about the, the use of roads in Peru versus Ecuador. I mean, I don't, I, I don't want to speak about all of South America. I'm from the Smithsonian, and I work a lot in Peru. So. In Peru, there's a uh, movement, major movement away from the use of roads, whereas in, uh, in the use of the offshore model and helicopter access, whereas in Ecuador, you, it, you, there's a lot of interest in the construction of roads. So I'm wondering why that continues to happen in Ecuador. My I second ask, I question. Ask you that. <laughs> oh, thanks. I was going to ask that um, guy that. <laughs> <laughs> the well, guy sitting next to you, ask him. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, well, if you have anything to say about that. That's for, and then secondly, um, going to back to the question that was just made about Correa's motivation. It seems like um, you say that he made this weird change um, in 2013 that was really unexpected. But at the same time, I'm, st it's still, I'm still wondering what he's motivated by. Is he motivated solely by personal gain and, and you know, the use of, of his personal planes and motorcades and things like that? When you do, I hadn't been to Ecuador for 18 years, and I was back in September, and I, it's a completely different country. The amount of infrastructure that's been built up in the last few years is incredible. And I, I listened to his Saturday speech about um, investment in education and healthcare and things like that. And it seems to be bona fide. It, it seems to be playing itself out. I don't know if, if that was just a superficial um, observation from a visitor, but um, it, and also we heard a lot about him kind of tightening the screws on international corporations that are extracting oil in Ecuador, and um, that many of them left because he's putting such extreme financial demands on the companies to prevent the things that have happened in the past, where companies have come in, caused all kinds of destruction, and left. So um, it seems like there's a lot of money to be made from the oil companies and he wants to make it but 
at least superficially, it seems like he's reinvesting it in the country. And so um, while I'm not in favor of major oil exploitation either, I don't think anybody in this room would be, how would you argue that you can make the balance between economic development and the growth of the country and then preventing this exploitation, which, so you know. We are a little bit tight on time, so what I'd like to do is get the other two questions that were out in the audience as well. So we'll start in the front, and then we'll move to the back, and then we'll try to answer all of those and wrap things up in about five minutes. So my question was on um, the role of media, and was curious about um, how much, like, so much of this to me seems like the lack of good information out to the public and communicating that information in an effective way. And I was curious about if um, you feel like you're able to get good independent news coverage in Ecuador, and if not, what other kinds of social media are you using? What is the role of international media in fighting this fight and sharing um, images and maps and these kinds of like fact-based information that d doesn't seem to be getting out completely right now. Okay, thank you. And then number three. And if you could just identify yourself. Sure, my name is Althea Middleton Detzner and I work with a center called International Center on Nonviolent Conflict and also independently on um, sort of corporate community relations and the use of nonviolent action to hold them accountable. Um, so I'd love to hear more about the movement and um, uh, what other kinds of actions you all are taking apart from just the petition and sort of the legal um, arena, both here internationally as well as domestically, but what other sorts of sort of non I heard like protests and petition, but I'm wondering if there's more organizing going on, more plans for um, additional sort of forms of pressure through nonviolent action, um, and whether or not that's only geared towards the government or if it's also geared towards those who are carrying out um, the exploration and the exploitation. So I, I think we have four questions there. The first is more about the movement. The second is um, how much of this is related to the quality of information in the media. The third and fourth were about the president's real motivations um, for exploiting Yasuni ITT. And then what was your fourth question? Oh, just about the like, uh, those, why there's interest in those in Ecuador and, not, and in Peru is moving towards offshore models. Okay, interesting. So have at it. You want, yeah, yeah you we have her. three minutes <laughs> for total of that. Yeah. Okay, so I'm gonna have to. So for the road, so I wrote a new paper about it. <laughs> it's under review. So we asked that same question, where it's too late to show our map, but we, so we mapped out all of the 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 oil and gas drilling in the Western Amazon. So we have a cool map, and we we have a color coded system, and basically show here's where they built roads, here's where they did it without roads, and we basically show all of the, the known new discoveries across the Western Amazon and basically these are the ones that are up in the air is how, how is it going to go. And so the interesting thing is, that, I mean, there's a lot coming. I mean, there's a, there's a lot of known discoveries. So there's a lot more oil, oil development to come in the Western Amazon. That's, that's the thing. It's not like we're just talking about something that's like over and we're just trying to fix it. It's like this is going to keep going on for years and years and years and years and years. So that, that's the critical question we raise in this paper. It's, it's like we have these two models, and you have all these new discoveries coming. There's going to be more and more and more as they keep exploring. Um, so if this development is going to come, you, we at least need to have this shift and at least take roads off the table. Um, and so, yeah, why there does seem to be more advanced in, in Peru. Ecuador does have one example, Block 10, where they didn't build roads, but people seem to have forgotten about that. So, and, and, and this latest thing that we've had in Yasuni, I, it, it just seems like the government authorities that we talk with aren't even aware that what happened in Camise in, in, in Peru. So one of the things that we've been thinking about is how to you know, educate Ecuadorian officials of of these models in Peru. It's just, 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 just so there, because we kind of feel like they don't under, like we're like speaking some crazy language to them about not building roads. They're like, well then, so how do you do it? And so one of the things we've been thinking about is like bring them down to Southern Peru and be like, here's how you do it. So I. Sounds like a good transition to the question about good information and media. Well, uh, for, first of all, about, uh, I mean, we're not against, uh, uh, solving the social issues in Ecuador. Of course, we need to solve them. But no development should be possible, or we shouldn't understand development uh, by violating the rights of minorities or any, uh, any people in the country. So this is what's happening. Correa is, 
pushing a development agenda, supposedly, but he's uh, moving for forwards, violating any right or any obstacle that he might encounter in order for his personal agenda. I mean, uh, his vision of development is one, and wh whatever other vision, well, it's not, it's not good. So when he was elected, he, there was a lot of talk about how, how we're, going to, we're going to put uh, oil, we're going to forget about oil and started to gaining more importance on other uh, things like tourism, um, investigation, uh, well, uh, some other productive ideas. And what, we've, what, what happened was that he, he just focused on oil and mining. No? So uh, we could have elected any other president who had that agenda. And uh, probably any other president with the same amount of money that this government has had, because uh, remember that no other government in Ecuador has had such oil prices in the history of the country. No? So there's a lot of money, and in order to, to, to invest in that money, they've done a lot of infrastructure, of course. And how would you compare his motivations to someone like a Hugo Chavez, you know, who's also very focused on you know, social justice in his own view mm -hmm. of the word? Uh, well, I. Uh, it's, it, 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 we would have to talk a, a, a lot more about that, but I think that, um, that Rafael Correa also has a personal agenda, and, and his, 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 the agenda has shifted in order how to maintain power for hi, him and his political party. So they're constructing a, a state model which it opposes or is a really big obstacle to any opposition who wants to uh, gain, uh, uh, gain political uh, power in Ecuador. Any per person who, st who speaks upon, now he's talking about the conservative restoration and he invents these enemies and uses the public media, which is really strong, and the public propaganda to, to get the, the, his message out there and to uh, vilify any people who, who, who speaks against him. Uh, you might see many of us next week or, or, or if you see in the past, he doesn't attack the ideas, he attacks the person. Who is Pablo Piedra? He is... Uh, uh, this, this, and this, and this, and this, and this. So, oh, so he's a bad guy, so we shouldn't listen to him. And um, that's how they're using the money right now. So, yes, of course, development is important, but if you're going to impose this 60s and 70s agendas about, you know, this military government, let's develop the country and uh, 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 vanish any opposition, uh, incarcerating them, or, or violating their rights, then, I mean, we haven't changed anything. That's supposed to be different, right? And uh, according, I mean, what is Yasunidos? Yasunidos is a, maybe Patricia can, can help me out there with other, other uh, initiatives we're, we're, we're having if I, I leave some out there. But we're, we're, uh, Yasunidos have, have done nonviolent political protests and have been brutally uh, uh, violated by the police there in Ecuador. We, we, we're not accustomed to, to, to being shot at in, in Ecuador before with uh, rubber uh, bullets or with paintball bullets and in the first Yasunidos manifestations we were victims about, of, of that. I mean we weren't we were protesting against the government but I mean we were brutalized by the police by that and th so that that has also stopped we're, we're organizing events uh, around the country to get people to know what Yasuni is, what Yasunidos is We've, for all these activities, we've been nominated by the government of Netherlands for the TULIP Award, the, the Human Rights TULIP Award, that's going to be given out in, in, in December. And we, we won a, a voting, uh, uh, e-voting e platform they put, up, put upon. So there, there, there's been a lot of advocacy going on. We're, 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 we're still discussing how, uh, what should the main big idea after this should be, but uh, we're also supporting uh, uh, little communities in, in Quito, the capital, that are opposing to minority in, the, in, the, in Quito, Pacto it's called. So, um, I mean, we, we, we can talk about it later, and Patricia is the one you should talk about that she knows about everything we're and doing. You know afterwards. about the whole the Pachamama thing, right? Yeah. That whole, okay. Maybe you can, we have to close now, but now that you've mentioned it, <laughs> you have to explain what the <laughs> is for everyone. I was excited, there's no way we're getting into it, but it was just, well, it's a long, Althea's question was just an interesting. In, in, in 10 seconds, what is the Pachamama thing? There was a, 
protest yeah. in terms of the bidding round for all these new oil blocks in the southern Ecuadorian Amazon. And there was a case where, to make a really long story short, an NGO was, was shut down due to their role in these, these public protests. And so that opened also a lot of questions. In terms, I think just along. Yeah, there's, there, there's a big new legislation <laughs> put out for the government in order to uh, uh, deny the right of any civil right organization to organize themselves if they're going to have a political interest. So Pachamama was closed because of this. Yes, Unidos is not a, a, a legal uh, move. I mean, legal organized movement. We're, we're, we're like uh, spontaneously burst, and uh, that's why they don't have any any authority so, uh, over us because uh, uh, otherwise we would have been shut down already. It's impossible to shut you down. <laughs> um, so, but it is possible for me to shut you down, and that's what I'm about to do. Um, thank you all for coming. Uh, this was a fantastic discussion on an issue that's really important and that I think we have to hear more about here in the United States. Um, I think you painted a very vivid picture of what the stakes are and why it's important to, um, to make sure that if this kind of development happens, then it's planned out very carefully and in a way that it has minimum impact on uh, these very unique and also delicate ecosystems. And uh, Pablo, you painted a very vivid fresco of the darkening political environment in Ecuador. And uh, we wish you the best of luck moving forward and hope we can have you back here again. So thank you, everyone. And with that, I'll draw this to a close. <laughs>